This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to, man, to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We're looking at the book of Acts, and we're looking at, therefore, the, the beginning of the church, the earliest church. And what we see here today... Uh, very vividly, is that the church was born in a pluralistic society. Even though it was in a pluralistic society, lots of different faiths, lots of different cultures, different gods, uh, it was a religiously pluralistic society. Christianity from the beginning made universal claims, claims to absolute truth. And not surprisingly, as you can see right here, uh, it got the first apostles thrown into jail there was real opposition to, in a pluralistic society to universal claims. We are also in a pluralistic society. Christians are told often now and increasingly now they need to get with the times. Uh, it's pluralistic now. They shouldn't be making universal claims. They shouldn't say you have the one true religion. Jesus is the only way to be saved. Um, but we've been here before. What should we do? Let's see what we learned from the, the earliest church. And let's look at this passage under three headings, okay? The problem with truth claims. See, the powers that be have a real problem with claiming you have the truth. The problem with truth claims. The problem with the problem with truth claims. And the solution to the problem. Okay, first, the problem with truth claims. Um, let's notice right off the bat what's going on here with the... Uh, uh, with the people, with the Jewish leaders themselves. In chapter uh, 4, we see them responding to a sermon that was actually preached in chapter 3. Now, if you go over into chapter 3, where we were last year, last week, excuse me, maybe, no, last week, you're going to find that uh, Peter has said a number of things. One of them is that Jesus Christ has gone to heaven and he's going to come back, and when he comes back, he's going to restore everything. That's chapter 3, verse 21. He's going to restore everything. He's going to put... Everything's going to be fine. No suffering, no death, no sorrows. He also says in verse 25, again of chapter 3, that through Jesus Christ, the whole world will be blessed. And so here in verse 12, see, when he says in verse 12, salvation is found in no one else but Jesus Christ, that's just really kind of a summary of what he's been saying in chapter 3. Now, the reason why this was so appalling to the leaders was this. Many Jews did believe there was a Messiah coming. They hoped in a Messiah. But they hoped for a man who would be a great leader 
who would help them throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. In other words, they believed in a private Messiah. They believed in a Messiah for the Jews. But Peter and John, Peter is proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah for the world. He's the Savior for the whole world. He's a universal Savior. And that therefore, the Jewish leaders and their whole interpretation of the Old Testament and their understanding of the role of, uh, of the, the Jewish nation is completely wrong. And so they're thrown into jail. Why? Because he made universal claims where people were expecting a, a private, you know, a savior just for a certain group of people. No, Peter says, Jesus is the savior for everyone. Later on, we're going to see, as we go through the book of Acts, that this doesn't just not, this not, this not only means that Christians run afoul of the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem, they run afoul of the Roman powers that be. There's going to be a riot we're going to look at in, in Acts chapter 19, where uh, in, the, book, in the, uh, uh, the city of Ephesus, they realized that the preaching of the gospel was undermining the, the cult, the temple uh, to the goddess Diana. The Roman world at that time was officially pluralistic. It was officially pluralistic in that the, the Romans said, you can worship your God. Everybody's got their own God. You've got your God. There's every town's got a God, every people. That's fine. Worship your God. Everybody has their own God. That's great. But you must also worship the emperor. You must say, Kaiser Curios, which means Caesar is Lord. So you can worship your God as long as you also worship Caesar. Now, what's disingenuous about that? is to say, oh, you can have your own religion, that's fine, as long as you worship Caesar too. And what that means is if you, if you worship your God and you worship Caesar, that means by definition you can't be claiming that your God is supreme, the, the supreme God overall. And, of course, Christians couldn't do that. They couldn't say Kaiser Curios. They could only say Christus, Christ is Lord. And that wrought, brought them into tremendous uh, conflict with the Roman government. Now, today... The powers that be, again, are pluralistic. And the idea, when Christians come along and say, Jesus is the only way to be saved, that Christianity is the one true religion, uh, increasingly in Western societies, that's seen as incredibly exclusive, very narrow, very dangerous. So the universal claims of Christianity get us just as much in trouble with the powers that be today as it did back then. Uh, and what are we supposed to do about that? Many folks say this, hey, Christians, maybe in the past it was one thing, but now we live in a pluralistic world. Your, your neighbors are Hindus and Muslims and atheists and secular people. And if you're going to, if, if, uh, you have to get with the times. You, can't, you can no longer make universal claims. You can no longer say that your truth is the truth or that your religion is the one right religion. If you're going to adapt, you need to adapt. And if people are going to believe in Jesus... Uh, and not be offended by Christianity, you have to adapt and you have to say that all religions are equally valid, that we're not the only right religion, that all religions are equally valid. Then we can live in peace. That's the claim. Is that right? Well, right off the bat, you see one huge problem with that claim, that, that, that line of thinking, is because Christianity was born in a pluralistic society. It was born in a place where its claims looked every bit as dangerous and narrow then as it does now. And yet, even though they were seen as dangerous and narrow and weird and outrageous and offensive, lots of people believe them anyway. Why? That's where we're going to go next. In other words, you see why the powers that be have a problem with truth claims that we have the truth. They've got a problem. But I want you to see now, let's, let's look at this. Let me show you the problem with the problem that people have with truth claims. To say, I've got a problem with truth claims, there's, pro there's a problem with the problem, okay? Here's the first. One of the things people say is it's arrogant to say Jesus is the supreme Savior. You, you know, here we are in this place in verse 12, very, very uh, out there where he says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now, what people say is, Look, you can't do that anymore. You can't say that anymore, Christians. You can believe in Jesus. Great, great. You can believe in Jesus. Just don't say he's the only or the best or the superior way to find God. 
Don't say he's better than <clears throat> other great teachers and other great leaders like Plato or Moses or Muhammad or Buddha or, or Gandhi. So you can believe in Jesus. <clears throat> just, don't say, just don't believe he's better than or superior to any of these other great religious founders or teachers. And I always go, wait, I can believe in Jesus. You mean the Jesus that said, before Abraham was, I already existed? You mean the Jesus who said, I'm going to heaven, but when I come back, I'm going to destroy all death and evil and suffering in the world? You mean the Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me? See, that's the only Jesus we've got in history. And here's what you've got to realize. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That may sound very arrogant, but the fact is that Jesus himself said that, and because he said that, and no other religious founder said it, no other religious founder claimed to, do, to work at that level. Therefore, there's no way to just believe in Jesus as if he's the same as others. Uh, uh, a perfect example and a poignant example to me, Toyohiko Kagawa, a great Japanese Christian leader of a couple generations ago, um, became a Christian, and he tells the story of his conversion like this, and it's, I've always found it very, very moving. He says, I am grateful for Shinto, for Buddhism, for Confucianism. I owe much to these faiths. Yet they could not meet me at the moment of my heart's deepest needs. I was a pilgrim journeying on a long road that had no turning. I was weary. I was footsore. I wandered through dark and, a dark and dismal world where tragedies were thick. Buddhism teaches great compassion. But since the beginning of time... Who has ever said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many under remission of sin? (laughs) You hear that? He says, I learned a lot from Buddhism, but Buddha did never said, my blood has been poured out to wash your sin, cleanse you from sin, to put you right with God. Buddha didn't say anything like that. Confucius never said anything like that. Muhammad would never have said anything like that. See, these other people never made claims like that. They never made claims that they, they could say, we can, you know, follow my teaching, do this, here's the way to God. But nobody came down to this level, to God was saying. Nobody met me at this level. Now, maybe Jesus was right and maybe Jesus was wrong, but he is not the same as everybody else. Because think about this. Either he is not the son of God, in which case he's inferior to the other teachers because they had this common sense and the wisdom and the humility not to make, megalomani- you know, make, make such a megalomaniacal claim, okay? In other words, either he is not the son of God and he's worse than the other teachers who are much more humble, or he is the son of God and he has to be the superior way to God. He's God come in the flesh. And therefore, if you read about his resurrection and you say, I think he was raised from the dead, if you look at the evidence of the resurrection, if you look at the brilliance of his teaching, if you look at the brilliance of his character, and you say, I want to believe in Jesus Christ, then... To say Jesus Christ is the way to God is the inevitable, inexorable implication of any belief in him at all. To say he's superior is an implication, not arrogation. Do you hear that? Let me say it again. To say he's superior is just an implication. It's not an arrogation. It's just the inevitable implication of believing in him at all because of what he says. Who, from the beginning of time, and Kagawa is absolutely right, nobody has ever said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many under remission of sin. Nobody's ever said that. Because if it's true, then he is the one way. And if it's not true, then he is no way. But don't you, (laughs) it's, it's absolutely nonsense to say you can believe in Jesus as long as you believe he's the same as everybody else. So that's the first problem with the problem with truth claims. But there's another one. Most people say, it's not just arrogant, it's exclusive. Look, we have a big world out there. And there's a lot of people of a lot of different beliefs and of no belief. You know, you know there's a lot of people of different faiths and of no faith. Secular people, atheists, agnostics. And when you say, your religion is the true religion, uh, we're never going to have a peaceful, pluralistic society if you do that. The only way to be truly inclusive is to say that all religions are equally valid. Now, how? How could that be? Well, 
Here's, let me just keep on going. You're going to hear this in one form or another all the time. It's, it's the assumption of 99% of all the writers in most of the papers or magazines you read in a place like New York City. It's the assumption of the cultural elite in general. It goes like this. Religion can be privately and subjectively helpful. In your private life, in your subjective life, the religion that you adhere to, whatever it is, 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 can be very helpful and comforting. Subjectively, privately. But objectively, there can't be just one right way to, to talk about or think about God and spiritual reality. Why not? Oh, because, it, this view goes, because God and spiritual reality is just too big for anyone to describe in a set of propositions. It's too big for anybody to describe in a set of beliefs. And therefore, nobody can say this is the right way to believe. So religion is privately and subjectively helpful, but publicly, it's not objectively true. No one religion is the right one. And therefore, all religions are equally helpful and valid, and we, you have to say that, and we all have to say that, and if everybody says that, then we will have peace. Because that's inclusive to say that. Nobody's left out. That's totally wrong and hypocritical. Even though that's what 99% of the people walking around New York City believe. And let me show you why. Logically and culturally, it's disingenuous and hypocritical. Logically. How could all religions be equally valid? If they are... There's only two possible premises. It would only be true if, A, there is no God. See, all religions are equally valid. It might be true if there's no God and that everybody's version of God is sort of a projection, an imagination. So all religions are equally valid. It could be true if there's no God. Or if there's a God who's so impersonal and such a kind of impersonal force that this God doesn't care what you believe. So to say all religions are fine, even though they have contradictory claims and all that, ah, they're all fine, they're all equally valid, that would only be true if there's no God or there's a God who doesn't care what you believe, who's a very impersonal force. And that means when you come to a Christian, if this is your view, friends, and you come to Christians and you say, you shouldn't believe you have the one true religion. You should believe that all religions are ways to God. All religions are equally valid. All religions can be helpful. What you're actually doing is you're saying, my view of God, that is, he's not there or there's no, you know, doesn't believe. I, I have a particular view of God because to say all religions are equally valid assumes a particular view of God. And you must adopt it, Christians. You must adopt my view and abandon your view. Wait a minute. What are you doing? You're being inclusive? No. What you're saying is, I've got to take on God. I've got to take on spiritual reality. The world ought to adopt mine. It ought to, you should abandon yours. What are you doing? You're evangelizing me. You're trying to convert me. You're trying to say, I'm right and you're wrong. My take on spirituality is right and your take on spirituality is wrong. What is, what is that? That's exactly the thing you're telling Christians they shouldn't do. The only difference between what you're doing and what we're doing is that you won't admit it. And therefore, it's hypocritical. Look, if, there's, if, if it's narrow and wrong to say there's one true religion then it would have to be narrow and wrong to say there's one true way to think about religion, my way. In other words, what you're really doing is you're being every bit as exclusive, you're just not admitting it. And it's not just logically inconsistent to say this. It's culturally narrow to say to Christians, you, no one should say they have the truth. No one should say that they have one true religion. You know why it's culturally narrow? The, the, the whole idea that religion is subjectively true, that's fine in your private life, but objectively you shouldn't talk about it out there in the public because morals and religion are subjectively true. They're never, they're never publicly true. Uh, they're never objectively true. That's based on a view called the fact-value distinction. The fact-value distinction is that science gives us facts and those are things that we can talk about publicly and we can, you know, we have, we, we, we can talk about them in, in public but values and religion and morals are private. That's value. And value is, is uh, private because nobody can decide what is right. It's all subjective. And facts are public. Now, where did that come from? It came from the Enlightenment. It came from the European Enlightenment of the 18th century. The fact-value distinction. It came from Immanuel Kant and people like that. Most of the world doesn't believe it. 
Most of the world does not believe that facts are objective and values are subject. Most of the world doesn't believe it. White people believe it, by and large. It came from white people. It came from the European Enlightenment. Now, when I hear in New York, when I hear people say, hey, you know, the world's getting more secular, more pluralistic. Christians need to get with the program. Only white people are getting more secular, and they're shrinking in number. In percentage, they're shrinking. Only white people. In most of the world, evangelical and Pentecostal Christianity, Islam, and all sorts of Orthodox religions are growing by leaps and bounds. And they're growing by leaps and bounds in our own, own cities, in North America and in Europe even. And what you're doing is, when you say to the most multi-ethnic and multi-racial movement in the history of the human race, which is Pentecostalism, I, you know, I'm, I'm not Pentecostal, but I want to give credit where credit's due. When you look at those folks, when you look at people, all these people, and you say, hey, you've got to get with the program. You can't believe you've got the truth. You can't believe your religion is right. You're beyond the pale. Your morals are primitive. You know, you're on the wrong side of history, and history is always right. You need to, if you get here, we'll give you an education, and we'll make sure that you start to realize that all religions are equally valid. That is as culturally imperialistic. That is as egregious an act of cultural imperialism you know, we European types are right and the rest of you are wrong, as there has ever been. Do you understand that to say, no one can say their religion is right, no one can say Jesus is the truth, that that's, that's exclusive and narrow, that is logically inconsistent and hypocritical, and it's culturally incredibly ethnocentric too. Ah, but everybody says... <laughs> If you, do, you know, one of the problems I have had over the years is that most people won't even stay still for the seven minutes that I just took to explain that there is absolutely everybody, everybody is making exclusive truth claims. To say nobody should make a universal claim is a universal claim. To say nobody should decide they have the absolute truth is an absolute statement. And uh, um, therefore, everybody is making exclusive truth claims whether they think they are or not. Where does that leave us? If you actually finally come to realize that and to say, oh, yeah, you know, if Christians should get more secular and liberal and that will that'll solve things, when you begin to realize, no, it's not true, that because everybody's making exclusive truth claims, then the question is really this. How then, if everybody's making exclusive truth claims, can we live together in peace? How can we have a pluralistic society, which we do have? How can we have a pluralistic world, which we do have, in which people who deeply differ in their beliefs can live together and respect each other and work together and be civil and live at peace and have a society of peace and justice. How can that happen now? And now we see the way to get there is not by, by one little group of people thinking that they're being inclusive, telling everybody else you've got to believe like us. What is the solution to the problem? The hint is right here. Let me just read you the text and give you the issue, and then come back to it. We are being accounted... If we are being called to account, Peter says, for an act of kindness shown to a cripple because he'd healed that lame man, and we're asked now how he was healed, then let you, this, you, and all the people of Israel know it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man before you was healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, and he's become the capstone. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Here's what I want you... Here's the solution to the problem. But first, let me give you a little bit more of the problem. I just said that the idea, the view that there is no truth, the truth is all person-specific and culturally relative, that everybody has to decide what is right or wrong for them, that there is no moral truth absolute that everybody has to believe. That idea is not only hypocritical, it makes you helpless in the face of injustice. It's, you have to look carefully for it. It's only a trickle right now, but if you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, you'll find that <clears throat> in the academy in the media, in literature, in the arts, there's increasing number, I said it's only a trickle, an increasing number of people who are saying, you know this idea 
that there really is no truth, that all truth is culturally relative, that it's always person-specific, everybody has to decide what is right or wrong for them, do you realize that that doesn't work? Because then, if that's true, then you can never denounce injustice. You can never say that this government or this company or this person is doing anything unjust. Let me give you three quick examples of this. Some years ago, the first time I read something like this um, from the academy was there was a woman who's a cultural anthropologist at a university, I think at the University of Rhode Island, anyway, I think in New England. And she wrote in the Chronicle of Higher Education. She's a cultural anthropologist, and she was studying... um, various uh, rural societies in Africa. And one of the things that she was getting just absolutely overwhelmed with was how badly women were treated in those societies, how cruelly they were treated. But she wrote this up. She said, I had a problem, because all of my life as a cultural anthropologist, as a, uh, a product of the Western Academy, I'd always been told over and over again that moral convictions are always person-specific and culturally relative. That maybe my evolution, my evolu- maybe, maybe my evolution has given me certain moral feelings. I may have altruistic feelings. Why? Because I was told that I was evolved that way. My ancestors survived better if they had altruistic feelings. So I have, I have moral feelings, and I get moral feelings from my, my genetic hardwiring, I get moral feelings from uh, my culture. But if there's no God, there may be moral feelings, but there can't be moral obligation. She said that's what she'd always been taught. Do you, you understand the difference between moral feelings and obligation? Moral feelings is, I think this is wrong. Moral obligation is, you must stop doing what you're doing even though you don't feel it's wrong. That means my moral feelings trump yours. Because, you see, if there's no God, then there's no standard outside of us by which we can decide whose moral feelings are right and whose are wrong. So she would start to push back against some of the leaders in the culture in Africa about how they're treating women, and they're saying, don't you impose your Western values on us. And it fried her, because she realized that they were right and that she had no basis at all to denounce what they were doing, not in the slightest. And you know what she, how she cl- finished the... the uh, Article, she says, I realize that because I'm a cultural relativist, I have no basis for saying my feelings are right and theirs are wrong, and I have no way to persuade. I only have the ability to use the power I've got as a white Western person to put pressure on those cultures to stop, and I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. In other words, my belief, my secular beliefs... That, they're really, that morality is relative doesn't really fit with what I feel, what I believe. You know, in other words, she had a premise that there is no God that led her to a conclusion she knew wasn't true, but she refused to change the premise. She just said, I'm going to go ahead and do it. You can read online uh, a couple years ago uh, a, a man named Edward Dox, D-O-C-X, believe it or not. I have no idea if he made that name up, but D-O-C-X, Edward Dox, who is an editor of the Prospect magazine, and when the uh, uh, Albert, and, uh, Vic- Albert and Victoria Museum in London did a, a retrospective on postmodernism, he wrote an article called Postmodernism is Dead. You can get it online, easy to find. Postmodernism, of course, is this idea that there are no grand narratives, there's no way, uh, there's no grand stories that tell you the meaning of things that Everybody has to decide truth for themselves. And he says it there. He says, we've come to the place where we realize that we don't know where to go. We don't want to go back to this idea of moral absolutes. Why? Because people have used them to oppress. And yet we can't move forward without moral absolutes. Because because what's going on now is people are saying, hey, it's all relative, so let's just do whatever makes me money. In fact, if you look carefully, even in the New York Times Magazine today, in the riff section... A man by Steve, Steve Allman writes an article about the death of narrative, and if you look carefully, he's saying the same thing. He, says, he, says my, he teaches, teaches uh, writing, and he says, my students, nobody wants to actually use narrative anymore. They just want to do, you know, kind of stream of consciousness because what the, the, he says, basically, nobody knows what is right or wrong. Nobody knows, you know, what the meaning of life is. And that's just the way it is. And he says, but you know what that means? Is that means there's nothing you can do about greed. There's nothing you can do about materialism. There's nothing you can do about injustice. Read it. Now, what are we going to do? Here's where, we, here's where we are. Get this. 
we're at a place, I believe, a cultural moment where people are saying we need to have universal values. We need to have moral absolutes if we're going to deal with just injustice, but we need non-oppressive moral absolutes. We need, we need uh, values that don't turn the believers into oppressors. Got that? We need non-oppressive moral absolutes. Because in the past, people who believed in moral absolutes used them in order to oppress and just, have, just get power. We can't do without them. But we need something that turns the believers into not just agents of justice, but people of service, people who don't look down, people who don't feel superior, people who don't trash other people, people who don't oppress, people who don't coerce, people who serve and love. I have a candidate. The gospel is exactly what the cultural doctor ordered. Why? First of all, look at verse 11. Jesus saved us through rejection. He's the stone who was rejected. He came to the builders, that's the leaders, they rejected him, and yet God has made him the cornerstone of the great new world to come, but he's only the cornerstone of the new world to come. He only saved us not by coming and getting power, not by coming and becoming a general, not by coming and getting on a horse, not by getting an army together, but through service, through rejection, through homelessness, through loving not through accruing power, but by giving up power and going to the cross and dying on the cross and taking the punishment for our sins so that God's love could come into our lives. He saved us through what? Through grace, through love, through service. And the only way to become a Christian is to give up all pretensions of superiority, all pretensions that you have accomplished, that you're accomplished, that you're more moral than other people. Salvation only comes to people who admit that they're sinners and they need grace. And that comes out, by the way, in verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Here's what's so astonishing. Outside of the gospel, everybody's identity is based on relative status. Do you hear me? Relative status. So, come on, you know how this has worked because you live in New York City. When you were in your little town, somewhere out there in the hinterland, you were the smartest kid in school, and you felt pretty good about yourself, and then you show up at Ivy League school, and you realize you were below average, and do you remember how bad that made you feel? Why? Your identity is based on relative status. You're not, you're not proud of being smart. You're proud of being smarter than the other people around you. Another story, very simple. In, you know, you know in, your, in hot coffee, in your little town of hot coffee, Arkansas, you were the best violinist in the state. And then you showed up, and you got off the train in Penn Station, and the, and the person begging, <laughs> playing the violin. You know, and people are throwing quarters and things, and the person, you know, obviously kind of looking haggard and, you know, sunken cheeks and all that, is twice as good as you. And you suddenly, you know, all that confidence. And everybody gets an identity based on salvation through works. Oh, we don't use the word salvation usually. We basically self-esteem through works. Self-worth through works. We accomplish this. We do this. Now, in traditional society, it is by being the best. Your, your role is assigned. And you feel good about yourself because I'm a good father, a good mother, a good husband, a good wife, a good son, a good daughter. In an individualistic society like the one we're in right now, we get our, uh, our, our self-esteem through accomplishment by being smarter and better and, you know, better looking and, you know, more accomplished and richer and, and more talented than other people. But it's always relative, always relative, which means there's always some people you feel superior to and people you feel inferior to. The religious leaders were shocked when they talked to the apostles who were ordinary men. And in a patriarchal society, ordinary men who didn't have the schooling, didn't have the pedigree, didn't have the education, would have been abashed in the presence of their superiors. They'd have looked down. They wouldn't have known what to say. Notice what they're really... You know what? They're they're astonished at what? They're astonished at the fact that these men have a new system of identity. They have been given a transformed identity based on a whole different system. Not only are they not abashed at anybody above them, 
it says socially, they are not superior then to anybody below them. Why? Because their self-esteem is not based on works or their accomplishment. It is based on the grace of God. You can only become a Christian if you admit that you deserve hell and only the free grace of God has helped you and only the costly sacrifice of Jesus has saved you. So you can't feel superior to anybody. And you can, you can witness the truth. And you must witness the truth. You've got to have a universal. You've got to have an absolute. And the truth is what? A man dying for his enemies. A man who dies saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We have the truth. But it's a non-oppressive truth. It's a truth that turns us into people with a completely different identity. And what does this world need? People go out there saying, hey, there's no such thing as truth. No. First of all, that is a claim. And secondly, you've got to have truth. What do we need? We need people whose truth that they believe makes them into humble servants to the people around them. Christianity can do that. Oh, Christianity, I forget, forgive me. Christians have been oppressors in the past, but can you get that out of the Bible? Can you get that out of a man dying for his enemy and that's the center of your life? You know how Paul says, I know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. That's an exaggeration. Of course, he knows other things, but what he means is that's the, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. Listen, friends, got to wrap up here. I've had people say to me, oh, it's so exclusive when you say only through Jesus Christ can you be saved. I believe, this is how the person often goes, that good people of all faiths can find God. And I look at them and say, well, what about us bad people? I said, you just made the most exclusive move I know. He said, oh, God, come on. They, they think I'm, I said, I'm not kidding you. What you've just done is you, you can have that. If, you, if that's your faith, that's fine. But it's an incredibly exclusive faith, much more exclusive than Christianity. Because Christianity said it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter whether you've been a hitman for the mob and you've killed people. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter whether you've been a prostitute for 20 years. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You repent. You rest in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. The Father delights in you. He comes in, gives you a transformed... In, identity. Listen, the gospel is an exclusive truth, but it's the most inclusive, exclusive truth in the world. Let us pray. Now, Father, we pray that you would help us to uh, uh, take hold of these ideas, and we need to not only talk to each other about this, but we have to talk to our friends and our neighbors in the city about this so that we can say, we can hold your son up and say, there is no other name under heaven but whereby we must be saved. And say, the world needs this, and the world needs people who believe this. Because we are agents, we are salt and light, we are going to work in the world for peace and justice. Serving them humbly around, humbly, with people who don't believe what we believe. But over and against them, we cannot feel superior because of the cleansing and humbling and invigorating grace of Jesus Christ. Teach us how to be agents for this message in a pluralistic society. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.